Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Hello everyone and welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what's mat what matters most at the knife's edge. My name is Raven and I'll be the host for the evening. Thank you for all for coming for the next uh, episode of Live Players with Samo Berja. So we're going to have about a 20 minute talk with Samo and then move into a question and answer period that I will MC. If you have any questions or propositions that you want to make during the Q&A, you can go ahead and throw those in the chat and we'll get to them during that session. And with that, Samo, take it away. Thank you very much. As always, it's great to be here. Looking forward to the discussion. Um, today, I will be talking about how to find the frontiers of knowledge. Uh, earlier today, I published uh, an essay that's based on a previous talk I had given on the topic. I think it's very easy to talk, and it's very interesting to talk about things such as epistemology, making sense of the world, institutional decay, transmission of knowledge, and so on. This is just very intellectually stimulating stuff, but the ultimate test of it, in my opinion, is, is it practical, right? Can it be practically applied? Um, in this essay, and also like a little bit in this talk, uh, I dropped the links in the, in the chat section, I try to apply it in a straightforward way. I think that fields have not yet been fully defined. So we have not yet exhausted the possible intellectual questions we can ask that are worthy of years of study or that might have multiple breakthroughs left in them. Just as in the 1820s, there was no conception of biochemistry, but the next field of biochemistry remains to be made. If you're searching for the existing institutions to provide you with an introduction to this field, um, you'll be disappointed. There's actually no possible way to do it, especially I would argue in an academic context where you are rewarded for making small claims, not rewarded for making large productive exploratory hypotheses. To define a new field, you have to do large exploratory hypotheses that completely reinterpret the old set of data, right? The methodological jump from anthropology to sociology to economics to political science, you might be describing the exact same political phenomena, but you're gonna be using different standards and relying on different literatures for each of those, right? So even if we're looking at a small subset of a problem, such as analyzing, you know, say, a tribal chiefdom of some kind, uh, you would be using these very different conceptual networks. But if your conceptual network is made completely outside of an institutional context, it's usually not going to be recognized by intellectual authorities. There's a reason the term crackpot carries the stigma that it does, because it suggests an antisocial obsession with knowledge, and secondarily, a uh, possibly bad set of fact checking. I'm going to, however, claim that the word crackpot doesn't even imply that the person is wrong. I think the strongest connotation is that it's an outsider, that the person is an outcast, that their knowledge, even if they are correct, has no bearing on the world. Uh, to make an argument that this is in fact the common usage, I know it's the role of crackpots in Hollywood movies, right? If we take Hollywood movies to be a good representation of America's subconscious and unconscious beliefs about the world, the crackpot with the wild conspiracy theory about the CIA and the FBI and the State Department and the president, that person is usually right in a Hollywood movie. But there's still like this person that you don't want to be or don't want to help and don't want to associate with. So what's up with that? And I think it's very, we love pretending that it's, you know, the epistemology is so bad and that if only the thinking is good, we will put it up in center and the thinking, the ideas, the truth, the facts of the matter win out in impartial public discourse. All the while pretending that this is the case, we also firmly believe that, you know, there's like massive gatekeeping and that the narrative is massively controlled and that there's, you know, psyops running all over the place and that everyone's insane and that their biases are throwing them out and that there are foreign disinformation operations trying to drive you to extremism. Well, which one is it, right? You can't legitimize the, the second with the first, yet we do this political alchemy. We engage in it all the time. We legitimize the insanity by recourse to the world of the ideal. 
So I think that the first step then in a practical epistemology is to decide or try to figure out is the field you are interested in working, has it already crystallized, perhaps under a different name, right? It ultimately, if you're studying a tribal chiefdom, it doesn't matter if you have to be an economist, if you have to be a political scientist, if you have to be a sociologist or an anthropologist to study tribal kingdoms. You just want the actual matter, the actual subject of study. You don't want the title, I assume, if you're motivated by knowledge itself. So you should then take a look, where would be easiest to study? Where will you be both the best informed by an existing tradition of knowledge that has highly useful concepts and have the freedom to make your own additional contributions? So it's quite possible that a field is misnamed. I would say that in 1970s America, the best sociological insights were found among people who, who had the title of economist, right? Um, recently, Robin Hansen proposed that there should be study for generalists, right? But the reality is a lot of people are already generalists. They just have very different titles. We call them writers, or we call them economists, or we call them sometimes philosophers. The philosopher one is currently gatekept by uh, academic recognition. The writer one is the only one that's cleanly not gatekept by academic recognition. For an economist, it's possible to get away with not having a PhD in economics as long as you have something useful or attached uh, some kind of institutional position. So it can be in the private sector. Uh, and for a philosopher, you just basically have to have tenure. Um, and tenure's become just like much more difficult to achieve. Um, there are some like other controversial ways, like I'm not gonna like trying to capture all the edge cases. I'm trying to, trying to capture 90% of the cases of which individuals are publicly allowed to think, right? And this has been a topic I've talked about in previous episodes. In the essay, I describe like the key places where you might find knowledge. So you might find it if it's already crystallized in an existing functional institution. You actually have to look at the institution as functional or if it's grown dysfunctional. If it's grown dysfunctional, um, you're actually going to have a very negative experience trying to advance knowledge further because the stated mission of the organization plus the actual discovery of new knowledge, these are just incompatible priorities and will trade off against each other harshly. Uh, there's the classic saying that science advances one funeral at a time. I think this is not true. I think uh, this is true in a very dysfunctional version of science. Uh, and, you know, if it's true for many fields, then perhaps many fields are dysfunctional right now or have hit their limits long ago. Second one, communities of practice. Communities of practice can be driven by either an economic niche or a social niche. In reality, of course, all niches are socioeconomical. There's no such thing as a subculture that doesn't have economic consequences or economic processes. And there's no such thing as an economic niche without social processes running, right? I would argue that, you know, the relationship between a doctor and a patient is like deeply, deeply social. It's not a market exchange. I would even go further and say that, you know, the relationships between people in a white collar office environment are social relationships, not just economic relationships. And then also, you know, I think almost all voluntary societies are providing sometimes with non-market mechanisms, some material benefits to members of various kinds. They can pool risk and debundle risk. And I think that's very important. Many people rely on these communities for what in theory insurance should provide, right? Especially in the domains of like say healthcare or uh, or social safety. Beyond communities of practice, you can also learn how to identify the sort of, you know, unusual individuals who are already masters of their craft, who are sort of like these exceptionally talented thinkers who are like, you know, the peak of the peak skill of artistry or sculpting or mathematics. And you can just try and actually learn from those directly. Really nothing stops you. You can easily send them a cold email. You can show up at their home, do their gardening, or help them out, review their papers. Maybe co-author with them, knowing that they get the lion's share of the credit for any paper they co-author with you. Meanwhile, you get the lion's share of the learning. These kind of steps where you start by evaluating institutions, you then go and evaluate the sociological reality of the institutions, 
And then you choose whether to institutionalize yourself. And note, if you're going into an R&D lab, you are institutionalizing yourself just as much as if you checked yourself into a hospital or into a prison, right? We live in extremely regimented societies. Sometimes that's the right call, but it's actually a burden of evidence to show that it's the right call. Either you go this type of institutionalization in the sociological sense, you either join the community of practice that still has a uh, landscape of social incentives that point towards intellectual excellence and skill in a domain, or you basically try to apprentice yourself to someone and make it economically and socially viable for them to invest massively into you. If you are an asset, you will be invested in. If you are a competitor, you will not be invested in. I think this is just so deeply, deeply true. And it's one of the reasons also that the current doctoral advisor system is a fraud. It's a fraud because the doctoral advisors have no personal career stake in the success of their own students that would be commensurate with the investment they would have to give in their students. So what persists then is only the economically exploitive relationship as you know, again, well pointed out by others. Um, so I would love to hear questions now, not just on this short, uh, this short part where I sort of talk through some of these ideas of where you can pursue excellent knowledge and so on, but also um, on the article I linked and any questions on it, very welcome. Great, so anybody who has a question or a proposition can go ahead and put it into the chat and then I will call your name and you can ask your question directly to Samo. And while people are getting their brains flowing, Samo, I just thought, could you uh, connect this specific talk to the overarching kind of uh, thing that you're doing with live players? What does this um, question of, of how to find the frontiers of, of knowledge have to do with, with live players surviving in the contemporary society? Well, it's not just surviving, it's thriving, right? Why bother to be adaptive to new circumstances? I think many life players, you know, some of the greatest intellectual contributions in history were made by people who are life players. They had to be adaptive to their environment because if their insight was counterfactually already factored in by people at a particular institution, then they might as well not have engaged in that intellectual labor. I think that it is um, very easy to save years or decades of time and dead ends by doing the thing that actually makes sense rather than focusing on some sort of strange performative, um, like how do I put this, um, knockoff of knowledge. I think a lot of people spend a lot of their energy in you know these kind of egocentric uh, fantasies where they pursue the appearance of knowledge so much more than its substance. And I think that right now, one of the key tasks at hand is, have there be enough individuals who are live players that they can generate entirely new frontiers of knowledge and operationalize that knowledge in action? So I think that it's very important to either young or old. So this applies as much to the 40 or 50 year old software engineer that has figured out that it's depressing to be a software engineer where you're paid a lot of money to build like moderately bad products or the person that is 15 is trying to figure out whether they should like enroll in college and presumably they both have like a lot of brain power, right? Um, wouldn't it be great to apply that brain power to the substance of knowledge rather than the appearance of intelligence? Like at one point, you really have to let go of intelligence signaling and just like look at the thing itself. And uh, only if oh, just a few people do this, I think we are vastly enriched intellectually as a society. So I also think that recognizing people, how people might find knowledge most effectively is a good way to diagnose the existence of uh, life players, right? So you can study, for example, um, you know, Elon Musk's famous autodidactical approach with rocket, rocket design and engineering, where he just grabbed the textbooks and learned. Like, isn't that so different than trying to like work in the aerospace industry or something, or like getting a PhD in it? He could have chosen that, you know, it would have been probably less time efficient. Great, thank you. All right, Anish, would you like to ask your question? Hi, um, am I audible? Uh, yes. Wonderful. So 
I'll just I'll just read out the question because it's pretty pithy. Um, do you think there's currently enough economic and uh, human surplus today that if there were a single life player capable of coordinating the incentives, a competitor to classical academia uh, would be viable? Not to classical academia, but certainly to current academia, because I think current academia is like ludicrously human, capital inefficient, and it's also inefficient in terms of capital. Like, I think it would be very easy to compete with literally all of contemporary academia in the narrow domain of knowledge production for about $2 billion a year and something like 300 very, very talented thinkers. Okay. Like I think it would be just very easy to do that. And, um, you know, if you didn't want to compete, but merely wanted to push on the productive frontier, it could probably be done with 50 excellent people and something like a hundred million dollars a year. Um, but, you know, I think that the best way to think about contemporary academia is that they are a va you know, they are, they are the cult of the librarian, recording, cataloging, and cross-indexing known human knowledge, grown to vast proportions. Like, I think, you know, in the distant future, there should definitely be librarians, there should be many of them, but they shouldn't be pretending that they are the originators of most human knowledge. They're not. And this, like, strategic overreach of academia into the domain of all knowledge production, just because there was some talented academics in 1940s America who made the atomic bomb, who, by the way, learned how to think outside of academia, right? Like, you know, Einstein and so on, right? Or learned in an academia that was really different from current academia. Like, that just seems this vast structural overstretch. And then connecting it to a system of indentured labor, such as the grad school student system, that's like bizarre. I think like, you know, future historians will like just be having a field day trying to explain this to future societies. So uh, classical academia, though, I think was more intellectually productive, especially if we talk about the German research university. Uh, but that's because it was tied into a very different socioeconomic system where it was inherently elitist and inherently self-limiting rather than in America where the Prussian research university was connected to upward social mobility. And, and you know, it is impossible to promise an entire society upward social mobility because upward social mobility is about relative position. So it's an impossible thing to promise. Yes, I'm saying like one interpretation of the American dream is inherently impossible. It's self-contradictory, it's self-exploding. Uh, other interpretations such as rising living standards, that's fine, that can work. Um, but the interpretation of like massive upward mobility through the research university makes it be not a very good research university. And the research university, by the way, was the idea that under, if the academics are not competing too much with each other, so if the librarians are not competing with each other, who produces the most index cards cross-referencing human knowledge, a library is not a bad place to do thinking. So if you can publish once every few years and you're fine, and you present your own findings and you immediately catalog your own findings, that would be a pretty good way to contribute to human knowledge. Um, but it's been long competed away out of that. And I still think there are many brilliant people who are contributing to human knowledge that live in academia, but I feel it's draining their energies rather than contributing to them. I can testify to that. I've seen that happen. <laughs> well, I hope, I hope this, the, the answer was not too long and involved, no, but no, it, no, you it did ask not. a big question. Yeah. What's, what's the exchange rate? Uh, this is a slight follow on, but if someone had significantly less money, but um, a more coordination ability, like how much do they fudge against each other in terms of you said 50 good people and 100 million versus, mm -hmm. you know? Well, I think the, the money is needed to make the, uh, the success of 50 people legible to the rest of society. I think just to support those 50 people, you would probably need like two or three million a year. I know a little bit more. Um, depends on where they live. They don't have, to, spoiler, they don't have to live in the Bay, Bay Area or New York. But uh, to make it legible to the rest of society, you know, you know, if you think about the ancient era, the Bronze Age with the massive palace where the God King resides with the massive pillars and halls and gold decoration and so on, that's really not for the king. It's kind of like uncomfortable actually living in Versailles. Your food is always cold because it takes forever to get it from the kitchen to where you're living but the palace isn't for you, it's for the subjects. So I think the hundred million dollars is the amount of money, I think, even with good PR strategy that is needed for modern America society to not 
to say those 50 people are actually great researchers rather than crackpots. It's just, that's just the money it takes to do that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That, that was, um, that was usable information. Thanks. <laughs> Well, great, great. I, I, I disavow crack pottery, of course. Like, you know, I endorse, I endorse reforming the whole of society. I don't endorse splintering away from it and creating breakaway civilizations. Thank you. All right. Next question. Oh, Billy. Uh, yeah. Uh, have you heard of this term, uh, super connector? And, and what is the role of these super connectors in helping, like, helping domains of knowledge that aren't talking to each other to communicate and, and collaborate. And, and, and the role of super connector is also to have an intuition about what things might have something uh, that's synergistic between some people. I think the super connectors are a mathematization and subset of a much stronger term, socialite. The positive social role of socialites is to be full-time super connectors. That is people who know many individuals and have in their recall immediately the skill sets of those individuals. But unlike super connectors, right? Super connectors aren't implied usually to be tracking people's emotional states. I actually think the socialite tracks people's emotional states, thereby is essentially a matchmaker for teams. And I think because the financial mechanisms are terrible for matchmaking teams. You have to rely on social mechanisms. So I would actually say that the best super connectors are socialites in very well-developed scenes that they have gardened where the social incentives are connected with the right type of economic privilege so that the people providing social goods are compensated economically if you try to make it all be market driven, it just doesn't work out somehow, or it's super tricky to get right. So what you actually have to do is, I'm invoking privilege as a technical concept. In many concepts, privilege is strictly negative, but I think here it's actually positive because it allows economic abundance for a limited scene of people. And then if the social incentives are correct in that limited scene of people, the socialites can do their work full time and it becomes ludicrously intellectually productive. I would say the Royal Society was originally this. Basically bored aristocrats inviting each other to check out each other's etchings, right? Come see my etchings. Oh, I mean, come see my rock collection or come see my plant collection or come see my like telescope. Isn't this a fabulous curiosity? Come see my library. The integration of social life, intellectual contribution and like economic abundance that you see in the Royal Society is like, sounds fabulous. If you would describe this in concrete terms to like anyone who today is laboring as an academic or as a programmer or as whatever, it's like in those conditions, like generativity is given, right? You are competing to be as generative as you can be. Um, and I think that those are very difficult to set up. I think some scenes in, in music and art recreate this because the artists have this alchemy where, you know, they find to have an earnest relationship between the patron with some money and taste and the creative person with the actual energy. There is a genuine social relationship between them. It's, it's not, it doesn't feel negative. If it feels negative, this means the social fabric isn't there. So if it feels exploitative, this already means something has gone wrong. This already means the scene is not as creative culturally as it could be. So, uh, sorry, instead of just answering a narrow question about super connectors, I'm, I pointed to a different type of social ideal. And then I talked too much about this social technology that's, I think, behind societies, uh, research societies and behind salons and behind the creation of many fields. Like say, I, I would argue it's not just the Royal Society, like the origin of archeology span came out of the same type of social environment where people who are already well off sort of competing with each other on the creation of knowledge and having both enough intellectual and social savvy to not enough social savvy to not be crackpots and enough intellectual savvy to like, you know, be not be charlatans. Cool. So I hope that that answers the question. Yeah. Great. <laughs> um, Sid, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Um, so do you think that live players tend to acquire knowledge through one of the paths you mentioned rather than others? Um, 
like say apprenticeship or a community of knowledge or in the case of Elon Musk being an autodidact and just doing a lot of reading? And how would you contrast the different approaches between live players? Well, I think that uh, it depends both on the strengths of the person, but it also depends on the state of knowledge. Uh, I think, you know, autodacticism is particularly potent when uh, there has not been that much good work done or when the good work that had been done in the past is mostly abandoned. So say, if you wanted to do science, being an autodidact was a great idea in 1550 because you're kind of at the dawn of the Renaissance. You can easily like do some private experiments and read some Aristotle and figure out, wait, we can, we can extend Aristotle or we can disprove Aristotle, right? So you can get pretty far that way. Being an autodidact would probably been the wrong choice in 1900 if you wanted to be a contributing physicist because there were these amazing communities of practice like the, the Olympian Society which is the one that Albert Einstein frequented, right? And then later, there was a true republic of letters. Um, you know, I almost want to make a joke and say latter-day republic of letters among physicists from 1910 to about 1940, where, you know, why is Oppenheimer citing Hindu scripture? Well, because he's read Hindu scripture. He's read a lot of it. He's also read a lot of Marx. He's actually thought about a lot of different things. And Einstein regularly would talk to the best philosophers of his era to clarify concepts, compare the wideness of the spirit and the intellect to the narrowness of the modern expert, right? There's something just off here. There's something wrong. Um, so I think that because something is off and something is wrong, scenes are really hard to find today. They exist, but they can be very marginal uh, seeming on the edge of being crack potty. Ideally, you have to stay on the right edge, right? There is no, um, let's put it this way, treason doth never prosper because you know none dare call it treason if it does. I think crackpots never prosper because no one is called a crackpot if they succeed, right? So when, when you know, Isaac Newton is spending half of his time debating, uh, reading into the Bible, the correct relation of the angels and of alchemy and the other half on gravity, we don't think, think of him as a crackpot, even though in terms of a cognitive profile, he's the archetypical crackpot. Like he's sticking needles in his eyes, for God's sake. I mean, God, um, you know, biohacking, right? Um, yeah, he did optics experiments where he would stick just a needle into his eye. Um, and, you know, his bet on angels didn't work out or so, or so we think, I think. Uh, but his bet on, on, you know, figuring out movement and gravity and mathematization of those, that did work out. Uh, I still, I still, you know, if I wanted to have a breakthrough in cognitive science, I would, you know, try to talk to a cognitive scientist, a young ambitious one and say, I think you should secretly read the translations of Isaac Newton's work on the mathematization of human emotion and tell no one you've read them and then try to translate them into modern scientific language. And I guarantee you there would be at least five or six excellent ideas. There would probably be breakthrough papers, uh, but he must never tell anyone the secret that he got it from Newton. Uh, stuff like this just happens all the time, by the way. Um, people are inspired by sources that are ultimately not credited. So it is difficult to figure out what the live players are doing sometimes, right? It's difficult to figure out where they're getting inspiration. And yes, the, the, I am also saying that I, I, Isaac Newton was specifically theorizing about human psychology and the interrelation of emotions, right? If you go read, say, Thomas Aquinas' theology, it's very clear it's talking about the specifications of emotions and when they appear and when they don't appear. It's not just making claims about metaphysics. It's making claims about the mind. So if people gave uh, Newton's uh, writing on that as much uh, the benefit of the doubt as they give Buddhist writing, I think there would be interesting breakthroughs to be had. But uh, the work of laundering Buddhism through science it was only recently undertaken in California. So maybe one day Newton will also be laundered through modern science. Cool. Next question. Yeah. Uh, Danielle, would you like to ask your question? Oh, your audio seems dead. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. OK, great. Um, yeah, so when I asked the question, uh, you hadn't yet specifically spoke of scenes and 
for the past, I think, three questions you've been speaking extensively since. So I will try to extend, uh, I, I will, I'll try to extend the question since you've covered so much already, which is basically, I know that there, is, there aren't a lot of very visible live players right now, and I, there aren't a lot of scenes. You know, they're kind of things showing up on the crack yes. pottery side and they're sputtering out. What are ways that some are sputtering out? What do you, you think might be the best chances to like take one and get it to not sputter out? You know, grow it from there instead of, say, assembling it one from scratch. Or, or, or I don't know, we could also talk about making a new one, but really, is there a sign of life anywhere? Because everyone's asking, where, where do we go? We want to flee the cities, maybe. Where do we go? You know, the United States is fleeing. You know, this is the equivalent of Constantinople. Uh, getting taken over by the Turks, and then everyone ends up in Pisa, and then you get the Renaissance. So it basically, was the equivalent sort of sort of thing. I mean, I think you're also asking about the intellectual productivity of cities here implicitly, yes. where yes. cities cities uh, a scene is always hosted in a city, right? And depending on the era, it might be Paris, right? The Paris of the salons. It might be ancient Alexandria. Uh, people don't know this, but briefly, British occupied Alexandria was also an intellectual center where random Europeans would go and hang out. Um, right. Yeah, and um, Vienna was such a city and so on. Um, well, the thing is that I think there are several scenes that are quite intellectually productive that have but I think it's always useful to, if you see a, a failed scene or a dying scene, that you take a subset of the people and redefine something right next to the old scene that however only attracts this subset because two, two, three reasons, signal to noise ratio. Number two, um, the ability to forge new ledgers of social accounting because if I know someone in the context where we are both like say Mormons and we're members of the Mormon church or something like this, and all of these like ways in which we track our behavior towards each other, it produces the equivalent of like an economic ledger, like a set of debts, debts and so on. So there has to be a way for the old scene to declare a jubilee where the old debts are forgiven. So that's why creating a completely new scene where the old ledgers of accounting are no longer like considered valid, this implicit social tracking of favors, responsibility, guilt, uh, commitments. Right. That sort of creates another frontier. On which to... Exactly, exactly. And well, again, and the first point was, okay, signal to noise, create a new social ledger. Number three is usually you have to find something new economically. I think that there's this beautiful, beautiful opportunity for all the people who have become personally economically free from technology to grow as human beings and become the next cultural frontier of America. I think the West Coast is an amazing place in terms of economic space for this cultural flourishing. What it lacks though is an awareness that we have to turn away from pure abstraction and turn towards the human to I, make, make it happen. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, I, I, I agree. I, I, I've been thinking, I'm trying to establish this, some sort of colony somewhere uh, sort of like a, a combined intellectual and artist colony that can be safe from the virus and so on. And we've been thinking inside the United States, it might be outside, but somewhere mm -hmm. it need, there needs to be a connection between the, you know, the economic, the technical, and, and the humanities. There, there, there needs to be a rejuvenation. Well, several possibilities where people have these limits on where they want to move or where they don't want to move. I, I would think that some parts of Nevada or some parts near Seattle might be good spots for this because they're close enough that people can still visit their friends mm -hmm. in the previous region, but they have enough natural beauty to encourage contemplation. Yeah. Uh, I actually unironically think natural beauty is required for certain kinds I, of contemplation. I, I absolutely, absolutely agree. And those places are on the list for studying the region. Okay, quite cool. great. Um, I think on the East Coast, there might be an argument to be made for like some parts around New York, but I, but I feel it's kind of burned out. Uh, it's possible. I think it, it's possible to do something around New York. I think in Europe, Berlin will be a fad. I think Berlin will grow to be an ever bigger city over time. And a lot of the stuff will, you know, 20 years from now, no longer be viable. That's currently viable. But right now it's, they have a good artist scene, all things considered. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Great. 
So we have a question from Charlie, and I was hoping that you could connect Charlie's question to a question that I was asked to read as well, which is, have you identified any live players in STEM academia? And then Charlie, if you want to ask your question. Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, I'm interested in the idea of seniors and how that overlaps with new knowledge. And um, you were talking earlier about there being these really happening creative scenes, but that they, um, I'm thinking that they don't necessarily give rise to new knowledge. So where is new knowledge at the moment? Where do you see it happening? And can you generalize about how the new knowledge comes about as separate to how a seniors comes about and sort of seniors of culturally creative happening stuff um, and, and maybe something about what the overlap is? Well, um... I think that the, the cultures must exist on the frontier of possibility where people have either reached the next stage of their life. So there is like a coming of age phenomena where the person switches their cultural context completely, mm -hmm. or they must exist in the intermingling of emerging of previously disconnected cultures. So either one is providing a bridge into them or providing a bridge um, between two separate things that merge, right? Right. Um, and I think the, the process of the crystallization of knowledge, where there is a lot of knowledge to synthesize, either because of the different life experiences of the people or because of two separate compartments coming together, because there's a lot of this work available, enough people try their hands at intellectual synthesis and they see each other do that that they acquire good taste as to who is doing actual intellectual synthesis and who's doing something else. There has to be an abundance, almost like a, a cognitive overhang, right? There's this concept of a computational overhang that people have used with the idea that, you know, as computers grew faster and faster and faster, but until there was a breakthrough, theoretical breakthrough in our understanding of intelligence, there couldn't be artificial intelligence, but the faster the computers were, the smarter the artificial intelligence would be once you figured uh -huh. it out. I think there's something like this with culture, even if that, by the way, doesn't apply to AI as it actually exists. It's just where I got the concept, right? So, so there has to be cognitive overhang in the sense that there's this overabundance of stuff that's been separated somehow by a wall of experience or communication that's being breached, allowing many, many people to participate. And enough of the people of, in the new subculture, enough of them are participating for it to be a legible activity in that scene that is like one of the strongest like resource preconditions. I still think it requires socialite and requires group norms and so on. Um, and eventually they run, they run out of the insight deposit or they run out of socialites. Mm -hmm. so, so would you analogize that to like the economic surplus that's put back into productivity? Yes, yes. There's right. a very, okay. very good analogy there, very strong. Mm -hmm. Thank I, you. I wish... I wish we could just write papers on that for econ journals or something like there's, I feel like there's material for something like 70, 70 or 80 papers just in the last 30 minutes of conversation. Cool. Thank you. Great. Uh, Albert, would you like to ask your question? Yeah. yeah uh, Samuel, uh, I love what you're talking about right now. I have like a mind boner just listening to you and, um, um, I mean, basically, like what you're going on about about like the uh, the academic silos and the lack of like transdisciplinary thinking, and um, for example, you brought up biohacking. Like, like I'm heavily into like health and nutrition, alternative health, biohacking, and I uh, and if you know the biohacking space, the people who are at the frontier of health of, of wellness, they're like they're coming from computer science. They're coming from uh, uh, philosophy. I'm reading a book right now by Sayer G called Regenerate. He's talking about how this whole, this whole idea that the human body derives most of our energy via mitochondria is complete nonsense. It actually comes from the structure of water because it's actually, water actually has four phases, not three. It's called structured water, exclusion zone water. So that's fascinating. And, and like my whole family, they're all in the medical uh, sector, but they know nothing about actual health. Like I'm a business and engineering uh, major who minored in philosophy and I run circles around them when I talk about actually how to live a, a healthy life. And, and basically my point here is um, 
Uh, what do you think are the benefits and, and constraints of, of navigating the current meta crisis through the framework of games? Because um, again, like I'm heavily into biohacking, and like when I think about it, I think because the thing about games, it, it is apt as in like we are playing something. It's imaginary. It's a myth. We do have examples in history of games that we played and how we're constantly changing the rules in order to uh, suit uh, new conditions. But I also, but to me, I'm playing around with, with biology as a, as a framework mm -hmm. because, you know, because like I look at what human beings are doing as like becoming a super organism. I've heard people use biological, you know, like as like a, as like a metaphor, but I actually see that literally as what we're doing right now. And I actually see um, us becoming a super organism as like, 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 like basically what we're trying to do. And my point is, I believe that biology has like countless examples of, 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 of successfully instantiated uh, anti, anti rivalries games, like serial endosymbiosis, where we actually have countless solutions of, of, of solved games. Like we actually have these systems in place. I think we just need to tap into the, the, the innate knowledge that's embodied within biology. So I just wondered, what are your thoughts on that? It's a big body to, it's, it's, it's a lot to ask for. It's certainly interesting to listen and think about. Um, it takes more to evaluate, of course, like, you know, especially it's like lot, lots of claims, like it takes a while to think them all through. I think that there is massive, massive overhang between different fields of human knowledge. And there are somewhat artificial divisions between them that we pre pretend are inherent divisions. You know, my, my intuition is the human mind is whole. It's not fragmented. It can be fragmented, but it's whole. So the pursuit of knowledge and effective thinking is whole. It's a single endeavor. And the incentives, again, of the librarian are to narrow it down as much as possible to create the most defensible minimal index card, which is perhaps good as a preservation technique, much as mummification is good for the human body uh, it, to preserve it, but it's not compatible with, with life. Um, perhaps like excessive fragmentation is not compatible with intellectual life. So that's, that would be my first reflection on it. Perhaps we go to the next question then. And I can't, I can't really speak on biology, right? It's not an okay. area of expertise. Great, thank you so much. Okay, I'm gonna ask a question on behalf of Coleman. How do you think about epistemology when it comes to current events where there are many stories about what's happening? Well, there's, okay. Um, I basically think that people need to, to understand current events, have a well worked out model of how revolutions work and how they don't work. They need to have a good model of economic production. They need to have a good model on the genesis and functioning of religions. And they probably need to know a thing or two about state formation. And that just handles the politics and the geopolitics. There's like stuff happening technologically and psychologically that I think is beyond easily accessible material. So in other words, um, just technologically to keep track of what's going on, you would actually need the tacit knowledge of like several different branches of expertise, like even to keep track of something basic, like, you know, solar cells becoming cheaper over time. Why are they becoming cheaper, right? That already is like a non-trivial technical question. Um, and psychologically, I think we, you know, we don't have canonical theories of psychology that we deeply rely on. But in fact, everyone practices, you know, we practice so clearly emotional transformation and working with other people. We all do psychological engineering all the time. Everyone's doing psyops, right? If you want to frame them that way. It's somehow our explicated theory of psychology is so primitive. So in this way, I think human beings, it's, I think human psychology is not that complicated, but I think we're kind of birds, right? Birds that know how to fly, but don't know how to design a plane or how to like, um, you know, even explicate the laws of aerodynamics or something like this. So I think that if one could have a better theoretical understanding of psychology, one could construct intelligible interpretations of what is happening with society that would overcome the limitations of our intuitions because our intuitions, they're not oriented to 180 million voters, right? Or 220 million voters. I forget the exact number of voters in the US. 
there may, you know, we, we can deal with 200 people maybe, but you would need to know things about the psychology of that number of voters or that number of citizens to make predictions on some things about what's happening right now, or even not predictions, just explanations. And I guess I am constraining this to correct explanations. And yes, I do believe that it is not just all narrative. Uh, there exists like a true fact of the matter. There is a physical reality there. Uh, we can't always access it, though sometimes it hits us on the head. I would argue that with COVID, what we're seeing is over and over again, the collision of the social narrative and the raw biology of the virus. And our system is not dealing with the raw biology of the virus very well. And it's not dealing well with physical reality. It is very used to salesmanship, right? And, you know, America has been leveling up in marketing and demagoguery for what, 200 years now. So we shouldn't be surprised that it's gotten so, so deeply enmeshed in this uh, MMO. Yep. All right. Thank you. Um, Nimai, uh, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I actually have a, I have a couple of questions, but um, I'll try to distill it down to, uh, to maybe something more essential. Um, uh, one, one thing I'm sort of wor interested in knowing your thoughts on are sort of, you know, if, if, if you were allowed to sort of imagine uh, an ideal situation and sort of the ideal institution for the purpose of uh, knowledge uh, creation and, and distribution, sort of what would those core um, uh, principles be? Uh, and uh, this is kind of stemming from the fact that, you know, I don't, I don't know how familiar you are with um, sort of what goes on on Wall, on Wall Street and different kinds of institutions where there seem to be a lot of corporations and banks and uh, investment firms which are heavily involved in the process of trying to understand the world, understand how it works, um, and sort of produce knowledge, their reports coming out all the time. So is a corporation a, a viable entity for the purpose of knowledge production? Or are there fundamental sort of flaws there, which which would make it not um, good for that kind of purpose long term? So what, so that's just kind of like one thought. Sort of what is the, the ideal sort of knowledge producing institution? What are the core principles on which it's it's um, built? Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that, and, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. I think corporate uh, the corporate structure can be compatible with knowledge production. Um, the classic example would just be RAND, the RAND Corporation, uh, though arguably that's bootstrapping off of the um, national defense state as was built in the 1940s, right? The military industrial complex. Um, but yeah, the RAND Corporation produced decent research. I think uh, Microsoft is a corporate body, produces good research uh, in Microsoft's, you know, little corner, Bell Labs arguably did the same thing. So it can be a good spot to do research. It's not necessarily the most natural space, but it solves the problem of creating socioeconomic niches, right? Um, so, you know, and it, uh, it at times produces these islands of economic abundance. So I don't think the profit motive is actually that helpful in generating knowledge. It can be very helpful in generating or encouraging practical implementation of knowledge. So I think that perhaps there's this very subtle distinction much as exists between like, you know, um, um, between production of knowledge and conservation of knowledge. There might exist a subtle distinction between the application and the production of knowledge. Now, I think that, I think if someone is claiming to merely produce knowledge with having no thought as to what it'll be used for, I think they are lying or rather they're confused about their own motivations because I think almost all knowledge production priorities have embedded in them, right? Just as you might, you might have something embedded in a market. I think everyone has embedded intent in, you know, what is most interesting to them, what is joyful, what is restorative um, and that, this means that there is like kind of a teleology of knowledge, right? Cool. So I hope that that at least answers the question somewhat. Well, I mean, I I kind of I wanted to ask that because I figured it would be perhaps somewhat controversial. But I was I was I was curious to know even in a if you were to sort of step back from any one particular kind of institution, sure. a corporation or a university, just sort of put those models that exist to the side and just kind of think 
in an sort of ideally what what are the fundamental principles of an institution which is sort of setting knowledge production the of, of knowledge production and distribution yeah i mean um you have to have a situation that one's socioeconomic position is not endangered by producing by producing excessive knowledge yet it is not built up by producing fake knowledge so in other words the disinformation incentive has to be very low right in both ways both in faking production faking knowledge faking uh, stuff even when you don't have it and in the direction of not being punished for producing the wrong the wrong object. Now, again, here, I will say there is something subtly problematic with the perspective of academic freedom and even freedom of speech that I don't think we have a good social technological solution to. I lean in that direction because I don't have a better solution, but there is a subtle problem. If you take my argument about the implicit embedded intent in knowledge production being true, then it is valid to consider certain kinds of knowledge production evidence of bad faith action. So my view right now is like, we actually are desperate for knowledge production. So even knowledge produced in bad faith should be rewarded and should be used. But some of it definitely is produced, uh, you know, for antisocial reasons, right? And I think this is the real intuitive, you know, like sometimes the jock and the nerd, right? The nerd sometimes has a point, though he's not going to put it into words. Um, like, you know, oftentimes the nerd is disdainful of the jock and does look down on them and is in fact mean-spirited towards the jock. They merely don't have the power to like exercise it over them. So I think that sometimes the crackpot is actually ill-intentioned towards society. And that's like the small part of this persecution complex that is real, right? So I started by sort of mocking society's, society's like, firm policing, social policing between the barrier of a professional thinker and crackpot, because the reality is people, if they follow thought, will end up on both sides of the barrier. But there is a reason and there is an interim solution that society has adopted, right? So I can't really just invent a better social technology on the spot. I think that would be, there are too many things to factor. Like there's, um, it's, it's honestly the life of a, the work of a lifetime. In great founder theory, the creation of these new, very excellent social technologies that solve problems of this type is the mechanism through which history is driven forward, right? More so than material production, because I feel material production exists in a necessary symbiosis with it. Um, so I think that this is, uh, it's, it's the work of a lifetime. It's the work of genius. It's, for now at least, I would, I would say that, you know, um, I think it is beyond beyond my like intellectual authority to speak on that. Great, thank you. All right. Okay, so we're kind of closing in here, maybe for our last question. Uh, Kyoshi, would you like to ask your question? Uh, sure, yeah. I, I, so you were talking about like how if you had like a hundred million dollars and 50 people, that's like kind of the unit of functioning the seemed ideal to you. And I was wondering if you had that, like access to those resources, what would you be doing with it? Well, I didn't say I would have it. I said, uh, hypothetical you or like a group, right? So if there was well, right. a scene... I, I'm, I'm just curious what you would utilize those resources for. I mean, well, at your disposal. <sighs> well, there would be several things. There would be, um, there would be grad school credentials, but with actual intellectual excellence, you would create a community of intellectual excellence that at the end would give people bureaucratically legible credentials. And there would be also a uh, PR uh, publication machine where they would be connected to book deals. Uh, this would give them both public legitimacy and bureaucratically legible legitimacy. And the uh, currently tenured would have to argue that the PhDs that they have are not real PhDs, but they would just embarrass themselves over and over again because the papers and the books and the visible output would just be so much better that eventually they would stop fighting it and they would instead try to recruit them to become tenured professors at Harvard or whatever. Uh, probably this would be a 10, 20 year undertaking, uh, but it's quite doable for that amount of money. 
And oh, part, of, part of it is, of course, that you need about 20 million to, I think, bribe a second tier college with the promise that if they allow to run this grad school, they will become a first tier college by the time this, this whole thing is over. So that would require a decently ambitious second tier university to, uh, you know, and, you, and I'm factoring in, even if it's decently ambitious, you still have to bribe them with at least 20 million. Great. All right, Samo, do you have any final words for us? Well, my, my words would be like, I just, I would absolutely love it if people, if they are in the pursuit of knowledge, if you are a hobbyist, you know, consider that perhaps you're just way more serious than the professionals are because you're just actually aiming at the thing itself. And if you believe that you as a hobbyist are way more serious than the professionals are, well, congratulations, then you should read my article again and you should think about it. So if I'm serious and if I'm going to win, how do I beat them? Right? Like, how do I make sure that, you know, this is in fact going to be taken in by the librarians, that the librarians will say, this is a valid input. We accept it and that the public as a whole can benefit from your knowledge production because I think there's this massive, massive need for clearly communicated knowledge that is not playing intelligence signaling games. Do you guys know how like the stock market is utterly disconnected from the physical economy right now? Well, I think the intellectual authority market is like radically disconnected from actual intellectual productivity right now. I think it's been really inflated for a long time. I think we've done the equivalent of intellectual quantitative easing since at least the Sputnik moment, right? In the aftermath of Sputnik, it became important for the US to mass produce engineers so it could produce as many engineers as the Soviet Union seemed to have been producing. Now, of course, the reality is while the Soviet Union had many excellent engineers, they were lying about the number of high quality engineers they were producing, just as they were lying about the number of shoes they were producing. And when the Soviet Union collapsed, that bluff was called. The U.S. has not yet collapsed, so the U.S.'s bluff post Sputnik that has all of these great scientists has not been called yet. Uh, it will be one day, though. It will be. So take your knowledge seriously. You are responsible for it, and you're responsible for bringing it to everyone's benefit. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, I'm going to do a little um, PSA of what events we have coming up tomorrow. So we have, as usual, the Psychotechnology Playground with Bonita Roy in the morning at 10 a.m. We also have a upcoming session focusing felt senses as, as the liminal with Abby Wen Wu and Zach Valentini. That'll be at 3 p.m. I will be doing Socratic speed dating at 7. And then we will also have the Dark Stoa with Pat Ryan at 8.30. Check us out at thestoa.ca if you would like to see our other upcoming sessions. And I also want to say a big thank you for everyone who's been giving gifts to us at the STOA. Deeply appreciate it. We see the, the STOA as a gift um, in this time of need. And if you feel inspired to give a gift yourself, you can visit thestoa.ca slash gift. And thank you so much for being here today, Samo. Okay. Bye, everybody. It's been a pleasure. Bye.